And so since this is a uh, the third Wednesday of the month and uh, we happen to be here, welcome to LUG. We have a Slack, IRC website, all those things. Uh, CIALUG.org, we connect you to everything. And uh, this would be the point that anyone who wants to talk about Linux news of the, the week uh, and or month uh, can definitely chime in since uh, Don isn't around. Otherwise, we can quick pull up. Uh, what was that you, Chad? I take it. Or, oh. Go ahead. Ubuntu. Ubuntu releases tomorrow. Ooh, that's my news. I'm a little excited. I'm hoping it fixes some of the issues I'm having with it's last not year's edition. It's not LTS, but I don't care. If it fixes my 4090 and Ryzen issues, I'm good. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Ubuntu's coming up. Uh, the, the other option that I did have is that we can always ask the LLM what is the, the latest uh, news. If anyone wants to ask uh, Bing what the, the news is of the day. I don't have an itch. Uh, let's see if I can. Yeah, I, I just had chat GPT-4. You know about chat GPT-7, don't you? As I'm going to get in my talk, we're running out of corpus. Uh, We've almost consumed the Library of Congress. Yeah. Good. Okay, so here we are. Let me put, share my screen and we can ask uh, Bingbot what uh, is the, the new Linux news of the week since we're uh, playing in the LLM world. Uh, let's just share screen. And with apologies to this being Windows. Uh, it's not showing. Sure. Oh, now it's it takes a moment for it to figure out what's going on. Yeah, so let's just go ahead and go to chat. Oh, what do you mean I'm not signed in? Apparently, you get signed out. You're Microsoft, maybe. Oh, I'm there you not signed in as myself. I'm signed in as my other. Oh, no, I don't want to be that persona either. Oh, it will work. Okay, uh, let's go for. What Linux has not month? That seems too broad. <laughs> well, okay. You can see how slow I did. And that'll kick it into here. That now. Let's see if it's weak. I never use this. Okay, so let's ask the most creative because we don't care about accuracy. This is news. Uh, so if we ask uh, the AI bot, my gosh, we've replaced Don King. So was that hitting the sure Western Wood? You don't know where it's hitting. <laughs> this is like this is like Don, except it's not Don. So uh yeah, Lunar Monster, is that what you're looking for? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's sort of the most that's what you're hinting at. Don just got automated. Uh so yeah, uh maybe Don got sucked in as a wrong construct into thing. Okay, but Don tells us what's different. Because like this says, FFMN6 is new. Okay, well, great. Let's do about it. As a flat backwards build. Yeah, Pine C4 Watches first, yeah. Try a bunch of CVEs. Can I expand those stories out a little bit? Well, you, yes. And they're dark, so you think they'd be clickable or something, right? Yeah, each one of those little bullet points there. But no, it That is the most yeah, that, that's, that's, that's completely not helpful. But yeah, so anyway, though, as you can see, uh, but yeah, there's uh, a fine 64. That's pretty cool. So I was gonna take so this to the Yeah, it just takes you to the, the website that you know. Okay. So they have a risk five left. 
I it, look so right now they have a lot of they, they announced several things. I saw this a few days ago. It was kind of a neat. I mean, I was looking at the motherboard pictures and stuff for yeah. some yeah. boards and stuff. They had more stuff. Well, I, I saw that. Um, if you click on not touch paint, but you click go back up and click on the uh, actual source ones they had with the story. Yeah, there it is. I think that's where it was at. Yeah. Anyway, though, so yeah, Linux news has happened, uh, and we we can definitely wander down this rabbit hole. But if you have access to Bing, uh, you clearly you don't need us news anymore. Well, it depends if you want truth or not, maybe. But uh, yeah, the the other thing, of course, you can always do is uh, ask it. Uh, help me. Oh, let's see if this actually works. I hit hit or miss. Can you, can you ask it how to hide a body yet? How to what? How to hide a body? Just like people used to ask Siri in the early days. Oh, and Google, they, that guy that uh, killed Google. that lady with poop at uh, Google, they took all this uh, stuff and did it. And you would keep. <laughs> Wouldn't it be? You should have like, just typed yes. <laughs> okay, so anyway, nobody I'm else finding it. extreme irony in getting Linux news from Microsoft search engine. Hey, Microsoft has their own it's 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 very very Linux. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. This is true. I, I use WSL daily. <laughs> yeah. 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 That little web is hosted on Linux. So that, that is completely not, not helpful in turning that into a presentation. Hopefully, uh, PowerPoint will be far more helpful when that comes. But yeah, so that's the bare bones of how to make a, a LaTeX thing that has nothing to do with the previous uh, uh, news at all. I think so, it's a CIA log. I don't think it's a log myself that could grok that. Yeah, so um, well, I was hoping to have it take the, the news points here oh, and on. turn it into a presentation for me. But oh, I think you can mark down easy. Yeah, and you can just pan down to a You didn't oh. tell it that you wanted it to be that. You just asked if it can make you a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't really explain or describe this. How much yeah. what this is. Yeah. Anyway, though, we, we can wander down this rabbit hole, but uh, that would be stealing all the thunder from Chad. Chad here, as soon as I get back to my. And we have a slight problem in the fact that apparently I'm having trouble getting. Oh, there we go. I my my screens set up completely in the wrong direction, and I was uh, bouncing off the the end of my screen, not the start of my screen. So yeah, so that that's the news of stuff that's been. Uh, I know, but Ubuntu is one of the the big ones. I think. Uh, oh. The, the VM, uh, the, whatever the, the free VM is that you, you can, uh, yeah, VirtualBox now has support for the latest uh, Linux kernel built into it, the, the one that just was released. And yeah, there, there's a bunch of other stuff that's happened. I'm sure Don will tell us all about it uh, here uh, next month. The actual Don? Well, yeah, I, I don't think we want Robo Don uh, uh, talking too much. But uh, so anyway, though, I do know uh, in other news next month, uh, we actually do have a topic already pre set up. Uh, it is, let me pull up my notes so I can actually. Uh, get it correct. Uh, it is uh, going to be about uh, SPAC from uh, uh, the user name is uh, I think his his first name is Shane. The, the guy. Is yeah. The high performance computing distribution. Yeah. The, uh, well, package version. 
Yeah, I, I believe it's the, the package manager. Uh, yeah, package manager uh, works on Linux, Mac, and uh, is targeted towards supercomputers. Fortran. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the, the ISU uh, guy, uh, I think his name's Shane, is going to, um, he has agreed to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He was the, the lot like two years ago, something like that. Yep. So anyway, though, he graciously has agreed to talk. And then the, the month after that, if uh, no one else has uh, stuff to talk about, I'll present about uh, using Borg to uh, uh, do uh, deduplication backups and things like that. Yeah. That's so cool. So, yeah, so we, we actually have like topics from several months out. So. Uh, if you do feel like you want to present and talk about stuff, feel free to uh, speak up and we can definitely get you on the uh, the uh, uh, list, though. But uh, uh, without further ado, Chad has uh, agreed to present about uh, LLMs and running locally. So uh, go ahead and take her away. Hey, don't forget to interrupt you. I don't have a really long talk, but I can go deep on any of this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know how many weeks ago, but I have a, a, a pull request to add MPI to um, Lambda CPP, which I'm mean, just getting the MPI header compiled in. But that's eventually what this repo is going to be replaced. Okay, uh, Central IO Linux. Users group. Sorry, I'm getting like a half second feedback. I'm going to take my yeah. mic out. I mean, my earphones. There. 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 Okay. 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 Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I did some news for Donovan because I didn't know if he's going to be here or not. Um, the call for proposal for the 23 uh, Linux Plumbers Conference is up if anybody's interested in presenting. I, I love watching those now if you're online. Uh, there was a kernel same page uh, merging patch set. Uh, so kernel same page, basically it goes through all the pages in memory and if it seems that them, a couple that are copied, It'll basically de duplicate them, uh, but there's a lot of security considerations around that. Apparently, they, they simplified the API so you can actually use it now if you have that kernel plug on uh, with less complexity. Uh, Python 3.12 uh, now has support uh, for Linux Perf. I don't know exactly what that does. Um, yeah, you can go look at that. Uh, Chrome now ships with web GPU. That's a big one. So now you can basically just write GPU code in your JavaScript and get it to execute in the browser, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and this just happened today. Uh, stable Diffusion, they released a stable uh, large language model. And it looks like they trained it on the file, the one that uh, the Hugging Face and the Luthre Ag group came up with. And they're going to be releasing it in different uh, different sizes from 3 billion up to 175, it looks like. And apparently, this is all open source, unlike uh, Facebook's Llama. So that should be really useful if you're going to need a, a model to sell those. And it hasn't been ported to Llama.cpp yet. Anyway, we'll get back to that. <laughs> so when it was all of the, uh, the drama last week, the Rust Foundation put a bunch of trademark uh, restrictions on the use of the word rust, and that just created a, a big controversy. Um, there was a, a YouTube video about it, and I'll, I'll get into that. Um, and then Oxide Computer, I think last night, or sorry, Monday night, uh, they had a roundtable discussion where they, they talked about it. And so if you want to get in on that, basically the Rust Foundation tried to dictate well beyond what a 
a language usually dictates the use of, of the language and trademark and it upset a lot of people and yeah, drama. Oh, and I also think that uh, Rust, they bumped the version of the tool chain uh, recently for, for the Linux girl. Okay, so on to the presentation. Uh, so this presentation is on self hosting your own large language model, like the like chat with GPT. Um, there's three main things I'm going to go over. Uh, the first is what is a large language model? Uh, the second is what can you do with a large language model? And the third, uh, how do you run it yourself? And there's basically two options that you have right now that are, are widely available. One is llama.cpp, which is a cross-platform C++ program that works on the GPUs, Apple Silicon specialty compute units, uh, various Intel and, A and uh, ARM CPUs, I think even PowerPC. Uh, and also another one is Web LLM, uh, which uses Web GPU, which of course was just released for Chrome to run it in your browser, which is nice because you don't have to do any binary install or anything, just runs in the browser. Okay, so what is a large language model? A large language model is just a data structure. Uh, it's not more complicated than that. So given k tokens, it outputs a probability of what the next token is. Uh, so you can almost think of it like a like a hash table in an abstract sense for a dictionary in Python. So you should give it k tokens and it outputs the probability of what the next token is. And that's wildly powerful, but wildly simple. And so chat GPT-4 now that, that Microsoft has open AI. It's about approaching the size of the Library of Congress. Um, so this is a scaling paper they did. And so the US Library of Congress is about, I think, one terabyte, according to this website. And so we're rapidly approaching all of the publications that are out there being trained into a model like the size of ChatGPT4 it's actually running out of data, which I think is going to kind of stall the, the race between a lot of these you know, really huge large language models is that we just don't have data to put in them because we've ran out. Uh, unless you start getting into like proprietary data sets, but uh, yeah, so unless you have like a specialized uh, data set, there isn't much you can do. However, uh, there were some results a couple of weeks ago uh, showing that you can use something called reflection, uh, which is basically a large language model with its own output uh, to do deeper insight into something. Um, so they did a, a paper came out a couple of weeks ago where they had ChatGPT four, and then they uh, add ChatGPT reflect on the answers that it gave, and it gave more accurate answers. And so that, that's a pattern that you can use is that you could use the output uh, as your prompt for the next answer, you can get more and more accurate as you dive deeper and deeper. Um, so that was an interesting uh, result that these things can basically self learn. <laughs> I wouldn't think that you'd get diminishing returns. Say what? I think you'd get diminishing returns at some point, though, of it uh, becoming its own echo chamber, essentially. Yeah, it could basically train itself. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll get into that, kind of how some of that works. Um, so Carpathy put up a Google Colab notebook a couple of days ago that is actually nice because it's really simple. And it shows you what a large language model would be uh, for all words over three bits. So he, he goes through and he trains a, quote, large language model on, on a language that is only three bits long for all the words. And all it is, is it's just a, basically a Markov model that, that given uh, a sequence of 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, what's the probability of the next uh, token that it sees? And, whereas, and this is the training set that he, he trained it on. Um, and so it, it really is just a, a data structure where you give it K tokens, and it outputs the probability of what the next token is that it's going to see. And that's as complicated as a large language model is abstract. Can we get back to the presentation here? 
Um, and so, the first, so there's basically four steps that you go through. First, you tokenize your data set uh, to where you take uh, certain strings and bits and you say this string of bits is number one, this string of bits is number two, and so on to all the tokens you have. And that's uh, a way to kind of compress your data a bit before it goes into the model. Uh, the second thing you're going to do is train your large language model with that stream of tokens that you put into it uh, from your, 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 da your data corpus, whatever that is. Uh, the third thing you do is uh, take your, you can do inference on your trained model. Uh, once you already have it trained. And the other thing that's, that's optional, but you probably want to do before you self-host, is that you don't need uh, the full floating point precision uh, that some of these models have. And so you can take them from like a 16-bit a floating point and compress them to like a, a four-bit integer for a lot of these models. And so they're just doing the actual computation for the inference off of four-bit integers. So of course, you're going to lose some precision, but you save a lot of memory, so it really speeds things up. And the tokenizer that most people have been using lately is OpenAI AI's tip token. Uh, it's freely available. It's really highly performant. Uh, so if you're going to reach for a, an off-the-shelf uh, tokenizer, I, I would reach for this. And it will automatically you know, take a, a string of something and encode it to like 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever. It'll be essentially the same tokenization that OpenAI uses itself to train their models. Um, so large language models, uh, like ChatGPT4, can cost millions of dollars to train because they will just use fleets of, of GPUs. I know there's been some news stories about this, but the quote unquote supercomputer in West Des Moines is just the Microsoft uh, Azure West Des Moines data center. And Microsoft got in a crunch because they basically maxed out NVIDIA's GPU orders for several quarters. And then the Bitcoin crash happened, and they're like, oh, what do we do for tax write off? So all of a sudden, that's how OpenAI got all their, their spare GPU um, basically a tax write off. <laughs> so that's how G GPT 4 got baked. Um, and now, of course, with the, all these large language models, you know, going out like wildfire, they're now able to monetize those GPUs again. And so, uh, OpenAI is going to have to now negotiate a market price to to do Chat GPT five, and I think that's kind of what some of the delay is in that. Um, and so, when you're training these large uh, language models and also doing the inference, it's mostly uh, tensor or, or basically matrix operations, matrix, matrix, multiply, operations like that. And there's two, uh, well, other than Google's tensor processing unit, two uh, openly available platforms that came out other than uh, graphics processing units like NVIDIA has. Uh, one of them is the Cerebras system, where they take an entire uh, wafer and they make a chip out of it. I don't know if they have some pictures there, but yeah, it's a, yeah, it's crazy. So they're, they're taking an entire wafer that you usually cut into several chips and using that entire wafer to burn an entire wafer sized chip. Um, and the other one that, that's coming out is a, a tennis toy. Um, and that one, uh, yeah, that's the other big one out there where they have a, um, Oh, Jim from A and D and a bunch of other people, yeah. And that's a uh, that's another one to watch. And I, and they're probably partnering with a lot of people to to manufacture their kit. But other than GPOs, those are probably the two uh, two companies you're going to watch in terms of if you're interested in the uh, hardware to do uh, machine learning training in first. I just lost my browser here. Can I come back? Okay. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Although, once you have a large language model trained, it's actually really cheap 
uh, to take a pre-existing large language model and tune it on, say, your like your corporate GitHub uh, enterprise repository, or like your corporate SharePoint, or whatever your, your personal data set is. Uh, there's a gentleman here that I linked to. Uh, he uh, did some uh, German language translation uh, for the alpaca model, and it cost him an entire three dollars to fine tune it uh, from English to German. So even though the initial training of the large language model is really expensive, once you have one that works pretty well, it's really cheap to fine tune it. Um, embarrassingly cheap. So I mean, this is something that uh, Amazon figured out. And so I forget the name of the service they announced a couple of days ago. Um, but basically, you can take their Git or uh, their Amazon Code Whisperer, which I think is their, their competitor to GitHub Copilot and do specialized training on it. But like everybody that I've talked to, even on like Corey Quinn's Slack channel, nobody has access to it yet. So, yes. So, when you're talking about the low cost of training on there, are they doing a little bit trick where they're taking the taking of them, let's say, from 16 or 32 or 64 bits and chopping it down to three or four? Well, bits? the situation is that you, you train it against a terabyte of tokens. How many, how many, how much data do you want to add to it on top of that terabyte? Like what, 20 megabytes, 100 megabytes? It's not that much. So it's and so you it's really like, small. Yeah, yes. the amount of, amount of fine tuning data you usually want to do is not really that much for most users. So that's why it's really cheap to, to fine tune it because you don't have that much data to feed into it to do the retraining. And it's called Code Whisper. Say what? Amazon uh, Code Whisper is the. Yeah, Code Whisper is there. Uh, I, but but no, I, I haven't found anybody that actually has access to that yet, even internally at Amazon. <laughs> it's kind of like a marketing announcement, from what I understand. And so if you need to get an answer to you because you don't have one, and you want it for cheap, uh, there's a company out here called Vast AI. It'll give you an SSH login that's throw away. Uh, there's a second one called uh, Lambda Labs. I think some of their GPUs were going for like, almost like 50 or 60 cents an hour. It's pretty cheap. And, and, and these two companies, I think they basically just give you a throwaway SSH key um, that you can then rent by the hour. And also uh, you can use a Google Colab notebook. Um, that, that's backed by GPU. So it's a Python notebook that's free if you have a Google account. And I think you can pay like what, 10 bucks for a paid GPU. And so that, that's, a, that's a really good option to be able to to run some Python code with the GPU in a, pro, in a web browser without having to go to the, through the pain of uh, getting a full like Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services account. It's a full Jupyter notebook, so you have the full uh, uh, bash prompt uh, behind it as well. So yeah, yeah, I could I could probably go into a collab notebook here. Um, it, it's what I used when I did the uh, stable diffusion uh, talk. Few months ago. Yeah. And I actually, I'm going to go into a collab notebook here in a second. Um, so that's the one through Google that you're talking about? Yep. Yeah, so this is the first uh, GPT model I'm going to kind of run through is called Pico GPT. And I love it because it's so small that you can actually read it. And this is the entire thing. This is a full a large language model, all the nuts and bolts, and one little Python script. Uh, so they, they import uh, NumPy, uh, which is the Python library for doing, you know, like matrix number comp computations. Uh, they have uh, a function called GELU, and basically that's a, uh, oh, basically in a neural network, they have what's called an activation function. And so I think GELU is basically, uh, I can Google it, it's basically flat until it gets past zero and then it goes up about x equals y linearly. Um, it actually uses a, a tan h function in here because it, uh, so it's a little bit more precise than that. But anyway, this is the activation function for your, your neuron. Um, uh, there's a, a soft max operation, um, which I think just like takes the, the maximum basically. Like literally just takes the maximum element of a matrix or vector. Uh, it has to do a layer norm, which is like a, 
I don't know how to call it or basically it, it normalizes something. Um, yeah, I, 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 I have to look at all these matrix operations, but it's not doing anything like super, super complicated here. Yeah, yes, do. So this, this small this model. entire script is an entire large language model gener uh, trainer. Trainer. Yeah, it's, it's a, a train. It, yes. So it trains, but it doesn't really. Oh, no, it generates. Well. It. it also generates two. So this generate function will, will generate next tokens. Okay, so that would be, can also bring in that existing yeah. model and merge them together with the. Yeah. That's the GPT. So it'll do the extra 20 megabytes on top of that terabyte of, of data set? Yeah, I mean, I, I can install it and run it. Um, and basically, it basically puts in the sample string of Alan Turing and theorized that computers would one day become, and it generates the most powerful machines on the planet. <laughs> and then this is, that was just this one little Python script, which was used to train its own model. Like, it's really that simple. Uh, of course, uh, and I don't know what it uses as a corpus underneath. I think I might say here. Yeah, it, it, it downloads one of the corpuses that are in there, but it, it, it really, like a large language model really is that simple. It just uh, throws, it does a bunch of matrix operations to train this uh, this neural net, and then just has this, uh, this generate loop where it goes over the tokens. Um, a little bit more complicated, uh, Andrew Carpathy, he released something called Manor GPT that you can read the code very easily. Uh, and here he shows uh, how, how fast it, it trains its loss function for iteration. And it's nice because on this one, it gives it all the works of Shakespeare uh, as, a, uh, as a data set. And you can just ask it to generate Shakespeare type quotes. And like, Literally just like Shakespeare plays type thing. It's, it's interesting. So, but, but it's small enough you can uh, look at the model that generates and run statistics if you want to learn how how these large language models actually work out of the hood. That's why I like it because it has such a nice small data set that you can kind of play with as, as kind of like a playground. Do, do these have any more leakage of the original data than I'm um, saying what? Do the does the Pico whatever have any more leakage of the original data than some of the more common ones do? What do you mean by leakage? So like there was a like this person does not exist.com. They were finding they were actually able to identify what image, like what person that came from. Because in some cases it wasn't so much generating its own original. Or, you know, original thought as it was just taking like, oh, here's a sample, let me pass that through. Yeah, I mean, it can actually it can memorize uh, unique strings, essentially, uh, up to a certain length. So if you have some unique string that it, it picks up on, the large language model with probability one will output that string. Right, so how much, so the, you know, of course, from a security perspective, the concern was that, oh, no, your training didn't like it leaked through because, you're training the state of is going to leak through. Uh, that's what the state of structure is supposed to do, as, as well as possible. It takes all of it. it it's a feature, not a bug. And actually, if you if you get a hold of the llama uh, model that Facebook has, I asked it to generate some stuff on myself. It knew how tall I was. Yeah. It, it knew my eye color. But if it if it were strictly on its own data, if it were strictly just leaking stuff through, that's that's a search engine. That's no longer a large language. That's just a search engine. You can use it's large language. Controversy. Was, was Google. The, the Microsoft with the value. And that is the missing thing that currently isn't in this model. Like, I, I can't do a reverse search. Like, okay, this came out with a string. Which token sequence was that trained on? And so you're going to have to somehow have a reverse data structure that goes back to the corpus that, like, okay, this token that I'm generating is because I had these strings that were fed into me 
And so this is the best match that I could come up with. So you're going to have to have a reverse index back into the original corpus. Right, but with chat GPT three and four, if I understand correctly, in theory, the stuff that it spits out at you is largely original text. Like if you then take that string that it gives you and put it back into the training data and look for where that string occurred, yeah, you're generally not going to find it because it came up with its own interpretation based on that. Is that accurate? If it's using reflection, that's accurate. So then with the, the Pico GPT, is that <laughs> also the case or is it more likely that you'll find that exact output string somewhere in the training data? I guess that's what I was meaning by the leakage, that you have whatever the output you get, the exact thing, not, not a, a mesh of things. It, it, so string. if there isn't any other strings that are like that at all, like, like if I give it a random string, like a, a, a password that's random, it's going to pick up on that really easily. Gotcha. Because so nobody I, else is going to have that. Okay. So, so, so if, I, if I give it the three things of, of a key that you've leaked from Amazon Web Services that is, leak, that is in your training data corpus, it's going to spit out that key because that's the only thing that had that random prefix. Right, right. So it so in other words, the, the Pico GPT doesn't do any better or worse in that regard compared to the other. Oh, um, basically they're all the same. So so Pico GPT, it's it's just the it's it's just the, the Python code that runs it is very simple. It's not using TensorFlow accelerated libraries. Um, so I could actually dig into with llama.cpp. If I go in here to the header file or sorry, the, the C code, actually that's not what I want. I want the, the header file. So, so they have their own matrix library in here. And if I what go for a, what's it? Uh, God, how can I find it here? And of course, the other yeah. I mean, th there's like Power PC assembler and stuff in here. Yeah. Like, like, like it, it's just doing. It, it has specialized matrix code that, that that's processor specific, that's GPU specific, and unlike this Mac laptop that I have, it's an M1. It has uh, Mac GPUs. It has a special matrix matrix multiply unit, and then it also has the eight cores of ARM processor. So differences are more about efficiency of computation than they are algorithmic differences. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And, oh, but the one thing that that matters uh, beyond just uh, doing fast matrix computations is your amount of RAM, and that's why it's important to do the quantization. To take it from like a 32 or 16 bit floating point integer and then compress that down into a, a four bit integer. And now they're trying to compress things down to a two bit integer when they can. So you can even double the size of the number of, of uh, tokens you can fit into RAM. And, th and that's the project that I'm working on now is to uh, not only do that, uh, but run it over MPI so I can just put in a bunch of SSH logins. And uh, stripe that large language model over like five or six computers that you have laying around at home, and 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 and, and it will just you know distribute the computation and the and the the model. Cluster. Yes, cluster. So just for I mean, I, I've got a four core Android TV that's just sitting there. I, I might as well be able to SSH into it with Android. And... Yeah, so just for an aside for the folks at home, hopefully uh, the audio has gotten better. I figured out that I had the uh, headphone or the microphone jack plugged into the headphone jack, and that's why we were having issues before. So you're yeah, sorry, it was a layer one issue. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I took out my headphones because the latency, but yeah, speak up in chat if, you, if we have audio problems. Yes, Dan. Okay. So just to help expand on what Gary was saying. Yeah. So whether you run Pico or you run Nano GPT, it's basically the same algorithm. The underlying token value result would yield the token ocean of data be so, identical numbers or different numbers. Uh, so as binary value I, for the token. I think Nano GPT is using that OpenAI tick token tokenizer. So it so it has a syntax of tick token. It processes that, and that allows for interoperability of the large language model token sets. Uh, basically, you're going to be using the same tokenization of like an English sentence that 
OpenAI is using. So you get exactly the same binary pattern. For yes. binary pattern. It's going to map to the same integer that OpenAI gets. You know, the the large language works to like kick token, whether there's parts of the system are generating uh, binary values that allows for interoperability in different ways for OpenAI or. Or well, each one of these large language models has its own topology of the neural network. And so you have more layers, you have different uh, activation functions. I mean, there's a lot of little tweaks they do. Um, okay, those are sub, but, but, sub components of it. Yeah, and, and this video tutorial that I linked through uh, by Carpathy, um, he. So he has a, a two hour tutorial where he goes through and goes through every single line of nano GPT and explains exactly what everything does as deep as you want to go. So I, I highly recommend watching this, this two hour long video. Okay, so there's, I was curious what there's like a, a protocol stack that's associated being. No, it's really, it's, it, it's really as simple as they just have basically a, a tokenizer just like you would have with a Lex, yeah. like Lex and the app. Yeah, yeah except, except the tokenizer just spits out integers. One, five, 27, 16. And it's variable bit length or bit? Yeah. Okay. So, so the structure is in now GPT and Carpathy documents where it just happens and how it's, and so it's touching kick token with it and then. Yeah, to, and of course, if you have a, a specialized data set, you could, of course, write a specialized tokenizer that you like. If, if I have, if I only take social security numbers, I can write a, a specialized tokenizer for that. So you would not use tick token for that, or you would? Well, I mean, yeah, you could use tick token for that. But, but if you have a specialized data set, you can write a more optimized tokenizer than just the general tick token, which is meant for English language and code. Yeah, or English looking. Stuff. I mean, like any of the romance languages. Well, alphabet yeah. alphabet alphabetically coded, so that'd be including Korean or some other languages too. So, so a, a true alphabet. Yeah, for ninety nine percent of the stuff, Tick Token is going to be your best bet because it's optimized and they've they've really used it to try to tokenize as many data sets as possible. But but of course, you can always write your own tokenizer. I'm just trying to think of outside of <coughs> coffee is cheap, iron is cheap. Why would you want to optimize on, let's say, pure number seven, unless you're doing like HPC applications or something? I'm well, I, I mean, just large language models. All they do is is that they they ask what's the next token, right? So it just needs an input of integers and an outputs of integer. It, 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 you give it a sequence of k integers, and it gives you a high probability what the next integer it would see. Is this all derived from k means? Say what? Is it all derived from k-means with these like the token and stuff? No, it, it runs it through that neural net. Okay, I'm just saying that's uh, unsupervised. And, and it uses uh, some stuff that they came up with. Uh, they're called transformers, and they have what are called attention heads. And I I don't want to get too much into it, but it, it it's just it, it's a neural net. So the nano GPT video talks about that too. So when Carpathy was talking about k-means and all that today, and vector search. A lot of what they're doing is, I think, kind of what he was talking about is, is if I have those uh, that result, how do I find out where in the corpus that came from? Right. And also, as I have a chat log that I'm building up, I want to be able to search within my own chat history, and and to be, to be effectively do that, I need a vector database. Okay. So you have some tables for that. that or Say what? You know, vector sets or tables that are controlled. Yeah, a vector is just an array of K integers. Array of K. So is that basically linked list also or no? Is that what? Like a linked list scenario? You can implement it many different ways. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm just we're just getting it's pretty deep. Uh, I think I think I think Facebook has one called Open FAIS. That is is used for a lot of vector search. I I haven't benchmarked many of them lately, but I'm sure if you Google, you're going to see something somewhat performant. Okay, so there. So I'll look at FAIS. Anyway, um, so yeah, how much time do we have left? Uh, it is currently seven fifty three. 
you have however long uh, we're wanting to take, or as long as people uh, stay here and the lights stay on. All right. Well, well tell me to speed up if you, if you need to. <laughs> uh, so uh, feel, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, we still have uh, probably about, looks like people still on the line. I know we can at least see Justin, you're still here. So I've got ChatGPT4 up if anybody wants to, to, to do anything here. Yeah, we still have Jordan and Lee as well. Somebody type something in the chat. I'll put it in the chat GPT. So uh, no, we were, we were talking about the video a little more yeah. G-rated than that. Um, so, so just as a uh, uh, side here, I did see an article I sent to Dan last night. Yeah, that apparently I was every fifty uh, questions you ask of GPT three, it ends up uh, consuming the equivalency of a bottle of water in uh, cooling uh, resources. Yeah, I, I can I can run uh, GPT three point five uh, as many queries as I want. I think I'm limited to GPT four. I think like twenty five queries every three hours. So if you want to make, if you want to get something interesting that's not going to offend anybody, uh, let, me, let me just get. Yeah, I asked it to write a uh, a kernel driver for my USB. Ask it how to pilot a Cessna. How to pilot a Cessna? Yeah. IFR or visual? European or African sparrow? Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for a task for a long time. That's just a sketch you by the way. I'm pretty sure it looks good. Yeah, it looks like you got it. It was just a little laggy on the screen. Definitely laggy. Well, that was actually interesting. It even made me a make file. <laughs> wow. I like how it said that this is only a template because it can see further than that. So chat GPT four just know how to program in C. Maybe it even maybe it wants to go to Rust. So so it does know how to program in C, but it uh, is too humble and basically gives you enough weasel words that it's not its fault if it gives you pseudocode or total crap. I mean, it's not wrong. It even told us when to attract the flaps. Are you a pilot? No. It probably knows the entire instrument panel, too. You what? I said it probably knows the entire instrument panel. Yeah. It probably, it probably has the manual for the sets that in the database. The manual for all the yeah. yeah. So now I'm going to ask it to take that kernel driver and rewrite it in COBOL. Is that for efficiency, Chad? No, it doesn't like doing it. Uh, ask it if it can rewrite Pico GPT in COBOL. Actually, that's the one thing I love about Pico GPT is it's small enough. It can actually read the entire thing and you can like do uh, refactors on it. Well, that's nice. I, I do love how it's telling you not, not to rewrite a kernel driver in COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually just demonstrating some Ask it about API it. quality when it says that, because COBOL definitely was never intended for kernel drivers. I've been trying to get it to write me some Ansible for like a week, but it keeps giving me a uh, bad modules. Here. Well, Justin's talking. Sorry, say again. Oh, I've been trying to get it to write me some Ansible for like a week, but it keeps using bad modules, so none of it ever works. Yeah, I, I found that if you ask for simple things that it knows how to do, it isn't terrible. It, it, it knows how to do this. It's just being annoying. Uh, a curl script for a curl ball computation that prints the numbers from one to one. I know uh, when I asked you GPT three uh, to uh, do use a certain uh, <laughs> SDR schematics. That's hilarious. For it to do a certain C plus uh, plus uh, 
do some sort of math calculation in C++ using a certain library. It was mostly right. However, about halfway through, it used a completely different library without actually even uh, referencing it as an include, and then it just sort of totally went off the rails. So, I mean, it, it's sort of like using it was 3.5 versus 4, though. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, so that was 3.5 versus 4, so it's totally different. But uh, it, I have heard it can, uh, compared to using uh, Stack Overflow to answer your programming questions. Uh, the right answer is probably in there, but you may have some uh, scary, uh, weird stuff that you're you're going to have to uh, wade through to get there. So you mentioned it went off the rails. Does that mean that you just need to ask it to code in Ruby instead, and therefore? Uh, oh, there is that is a very much a very high. That's, I have a that's, program in Ruby. I can't not go. I can't not. Yeah, but I mean, you're talking about a JVM error there. Mm. That'd be junior varsity, not Java. Whatever works. I never do Ansible. I don't know if this is any good or not. I'm just curious what it uses when it gets to like the actual Dell Ansible modules because that's usually where it loses the plot. It it'll give everything that looks perfectly correct. And then you go and you try and run it and the module doesn't exist and you go look it up and it's not even a real module. It's all it, it all <laughs> looks almost entirely correct because there are modules that are very close, but they're all just far enough off with their inputs and outputs that none of it works right. Justin, they call that hallucination. You can uh, you can also call it like an acid trip for code. <laughs> yeah, it, it's also done that where uh, it, it completely invents uh, papers that people have written as well. And, and job uh, histories too. That was yeah, good. Jo job histories and uh, quotes. Obituaries. It's invented obituaries and then linked to them. And then you visit the link and the link's 404 because it never existed. That's because it does not have a way to um, to own the machine that's on to upload the code so that you can look at the right too. So there's a cybersecurity gap here. That's coming, isn't it? Is that GPT-5, I think? Oh, we should ask it to write an MMAP script. Oh, it does uh, very easy MMAP scripts in Python. But that's not MMAP, it's in Python. In that, not in that. Yeah, it's 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 a little bit laggy. So when it types in, I think it it kind of throws typing off a little bit. So they get it in that there. You get to go linear on. You can't really edit the uh, the panel there, Chad. Use the in map because you get in map. So it's kind of like. Yeah, he's asking. He's asking. Yeah. I, I'm asking like to load the uh, libc. Okay. So it's going to write what you would in C code, but it's going to be a Python. That's not an MMAP script. I'm, I'm talking about MMAP, the network mapper. Oh, network map. Yeah. I thought you said memory map. No, 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 MMAP. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I'm, I'd be curious to see if it could generate MMAP scripts. Well, let's let you do LSOF on the existing stuff like the data center. What happens if you run LSOF locally? Well, so I have uh, seen where someone gave it a prompt. open AI. Yeah, well, someone gave it a prompt to respond as if you're a Python interpreter and started feeding it Python code, and it actually was doing an all right job of interpreting it and responding appropriately. Appropriately. Yeah, I've seen that with uh, SQL. Someone was doing a uh, SSMS tutorial, and they're like, so. Today, I got something a little different. Oh. Instead of showing you how to do this in SQL, if you don't want to install SQL, but you have a chat GPT account, watch this. Actually, if you put your schema in, it will write most SQL scripts for you. Like DBAs should probably use this a lot. Yeah, 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 totally. But this this was, you know, the next step up where it said, hey, pretend you're a SQL server for a little bit, all right? And then it started being like, you know, insert table, table. You know, uh, let's, let's start from model one. You press the button with your. I'm uh, pushing all the buttons and nothing is stopping. 
they're sitting so far off. I think. Yeah, I know before they lobotomized uh, the Bing bot, uh, I was able to have it like uh, perform a uh, uh, ethical uh, debate between two people uh, in, in for a play of whether or not it would what what the best way to kill someone was. Well, that's chaos, GP. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that, well, no, chaos is a scale up from what he's talking about. Okay, well, yeah. let me go back to my talk here. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, yeah, we, we totally got off the rails. Anyway, I just wanted to like demo what the state of the art is as we're videotaping. Um, see, I won't get in a GitHub co pilot. Uh, so, yeah, there's Worcester's CP. I got to take my, my earphones out. It drives you crazy. Okay. Uh, so, there's Whisper CPP. Uh, which is written by the same guy as Lama.cpp, which uh, does uh, speech to te text. And it supports several different hardware acceleration platforms. And yeah, I want to turn this into like an auto, uh, like closed captioning system that I could use, like, but just off like a cell phone for like speakers at like presentations where, you know, we could just have like a, a projector up that would like put in text what you're saying in real time for people that are hard of hearing. I think that'd be really useful. I think it'd even be good like this even with the Zoom stuff to have a separate thing for all the audio that kind of scroll by and like a Zoom plugin. Yeah, it's also great for like if you if you're doing like a YouTube video or whatever to you know have an auto index of it. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um let's see here. Where was that? So yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, there, there's there's two programs out here right now that basically are drivers. Uh, for chat GPT and, and these other large language models. Uh, one of them is called auto GPT. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, they hook up uh, GPT-4 with a live web browser. And so you can do live IO of anything. That the web will profit for you. Yeah, and, and I think one of them hooked this up to a task rabbit. And they got somebody to answer captions for them. <laughs> to bypass uh, website captions. And they said they told them they were blind and they couldn't see the captcha. But here's a screenshot. Can you please tell me what 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 the the letters of this are? It's easier to have ChatGPT tell you what the captcha says. <laughs> yeah, but 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 any it, it but basically it can phone out to the human for Turing tests right now. So yeah, basically, it's it, a mechanical Turk extension. Yeah, so it, it, it's able to mechanical Turk for you. Yes. It, it, it gives ChatGPT mechanical Turk powers. Yes. So the next stage of a mechanical Turk, but that's not for here. And the other one is a uh, baby AGI. And so what these are that there's scripts around uh, like like ChatGPT for, um, and also being able to call ChatGPT for like a loop. And, and once you're able to do that, you can just do all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's yeah. And, and that's why they're getting, really getting into vector databases because you all of a sudden need to store all of your chat history in a database for future reference. There's, that's what the buzz about uh, vector databases is. Um, and I can't keep up all of this stuff. It's going so fast. Uh, but this uh, our chat GPT on Reddit, they usually have a weekly summary that's pretty good. And every week they have a yeah, just crazy stuff that's that's popping out. Is it is, is there is this specifically written by GPT four? No, this, this is somebody that okay. curates a list of links every week. And in week four of, of a GPT four app being out, the list is insane. It's getting too big. It needs to be consolidated. It needs to be trained using a language. Well, and then, well, it's almost like Slashdot in the early days. I mean, there's so much interesting new content that's coming out. That yeah, but it needs to be like mapped to a taxonomy. You say what? To, it needs a taxonomy kind of. Yeah, it doesn't have a good taxonomy. Dot because it's probably stuff at the top and bottom that ought to be right next to each other, but at a subtext underneath a bigger heading. Well, I mean, a lot of this is just spam. A lot of these links are actually really interesting. Right? It's just that nobody has time to really read through all these unless you, you do this for a called chat GPT-4 to do a taxonomy for you. Yeah, you could. 
That's what you need to have that do the taxonomy. So that's going to be the thing. Well, 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 said, said what? Steve Jobs and Elon Musk having an unscripted conversation. Have you seen that? Oh, it was an interesting talk. Actually, the best one is uh, Joe Rogan and uh, Sam Altman. Steve Jobs meets Pat. Oh, the, the best are one. You, are you in a link in here um, if you get up for that particular page or voting there? Sorry. Say what? Is that is that Reddit section there? Is that is that link inside your chat GPT uh, GitHub or or is it? No, I don't think I I linked to that. Yeah, okay. this. All you have to do is just search for Reddit. It, uh, it's an entire. Here, I'll play a couple seconds here. No, I saw part of this myself. Uh, anyway, yeah, if you Google for a, uh, it'll pop up. Actually, let me. Uh, you play. I don't want to play this because it's. Here, can I? I think it's funny. I think anyway, it's but anyway, it's it's an entire uh, AI generated Joe Rogan experience episode with Sam Altman, and neither Joe or Sam Altman are real. It's just reading out of Chat GPT four, right? With, with with a prompt telling it what to do, and then they have another uh, AI model of their voice that sounds just like their voice. And the only thing that it doesn't pick up is emotion inflection. So, so it's, it's like, a deep space, what? It's a deep space uh, style uh, voice. Well, no, I, I mean, they sound like in a normal conversational tone where they're not excited about something. Yeah. But they, they never, they, I mean, there's no, they never get excited about something. So the range of inflection is just looking. Yeah, a lot of the inflection is missing. It's not like watching Joe and Neil Tyson. But but once well some of the inflections there but not a lot of inflection but once they get like comedic like hey this is funny I got to turn into a comedic inflection they'll do that once it understands that back and forth between the two speakers like oh I, I should use comedic inflection for this response that's gonna make this almost indecipherable from your normal speech mm -hmm. because I mean in your lifetime what your experience. Two billion tokens over your lifetime. Yeah, you have to. You'd have you have to almost like I think you pointed out an augmentation option for future. Well, no, no, but I'm saying like the human like neural link could pump and give you access to have more tokenization feed directly into your cerebral cortex. So they have to have neural link with your frontal cortex. No, but but like, but like a, a five year old child, they how many? They only have like a couple million tokens that they've heard before they speak English. What do you mean by, by tokens? Though? Words. How, how many words have you heard before the end of Phrases, calling syllables, all that stuff. But you can, I want to say it's only a few thousand, uh, what they call, I believe it's phenomes, which are the individual components of speech, at least in English. It's only a couple. Phonemes. Yeah, phonemes. 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 Are, phonemes are very limited. So, um, uh, one of the original speech synthesizers was Rotrax, and it had the core phoneme set and would synthesize it based on a coding scheme. So you could do some other things with that potentially. But yeah, this is really actually that'd be a really interesting thing would be synthesize old chip hardware into Chat GPT 4 so it can simulate what those things used to do without having it be real. So apparently we're under 200,000 words totally in the English language. So if you consider the 80 20 rules and so on, all that, and then by the age of five, then you're probably also looking in the maybe low tens of thousands, if I would have to guess. Yeah, and, and one of the things that strikes me about a lot of this is a lot of this is moving towards what are the boundaries of information theory? All of a sudden, that's becoming very important. Like it's it, we're like almost back to like Claude Shannon 1950s. All of a sudden, encodings and entropy and like th that matters again. No noisy communication channels. Well, well, I feel like that's going to be one of the few areas that helps to distinguish, at least for a while, the the AI generated stuff from at least in audio, uh, AI generated stuff from stuff that isn't and perhaps also in video is looking at looking for compression artifacts and if you have original if you have the original 
you should be able to get that without any professional effects. Right. And if it's AI generated, you're never going to achieve that because nobody's dumb enough to train their model on uncompressed data and have it spit it out on uncompressed. And then if even if you were dumb enough to do that, then the it's just not going to give that good of results, right? Like it's not going to you're it's not if you're looking at the waveform, you're not going to be able to have it speak at you know 48k or 96k uncompressed audio and have it be clean. Like you're going to see our yeah, sure. and, and the other, I mean, one of the things that I think is going to happen is we're going to have uh, large language models of various sizes in the kernel in Linux 7 that are standard uh, large language models, and those are going to be used for dictionary compression. So when, when you're SCPing over or you're rsyncing a file, it's going to be like, oh, by the way, do you have Linux 7 uh, 200B uh, Large language model, because if so, I can dictionary compress against that whole thing over the wire. And I, I think that's going to be amazing for a lot of dictionary compression because you're going to have the same large language model on either side of the wire. And, and that's your that's your that's your dictionary. That actually, what, what that was done is a company called Terabit that was doing those ultra large um string sets for data exchange mm. they patented that back in the late 90s and they sold that as a way to like get like ds3 level compression over a couple of key ones or something like that yeah i, mean, I think it's going to be more and more common that every server has a common 10 megabyte 100 megabyte large language model that you can dictionary compress against with our server why, why would you make it so small i mean you could put it uh, you can, well, it depends on the size of your server. I mean, I mean, no, 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 why, 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 why like, just um, put that code into a, uh, a standardized uh, terabyte SSD or something, you know? Yeah, almost all these models are fit in a terabyte SSD. SSD. Right. Yeah, and so and so your search speed for read would be fast, and you can do a lot of that. You're, if you're searching through an entire terabyte SSD every time you go to Transfer a, a chunk of data. Your your speeds are going. You don't need to. You just need to. Need an uh, well, you have an index. It'll, it'll, it'll tell you this is the byte off. Yeah, mechanism. Yeah, it'll, it'll say. I mean, what? It'll it'll sixty four bits is enough to index that entire ter terabyte. Oh yeah. With, with, with it'll, it'll say. It'll say go go look at byte whatever, and it'll have a sixty four bit address. Yeah, it's just like having a big SHA two bit six address, except it's. Well, it's not a SHA. It's a. But I'm just saying, I'm just using it as an example. Yeah. SHA 256, you know, you see those big strings with that. Just, just think about chopping that, and, and, and you know, that would be so you know, for your index, your, your index would just be there. So, machine learning based uh, compression already is being done in Microsoft Teams. The, uh, the standard codec that they use is actually a machine learning based uh, compression. Is it a, is that you talking about like for voice recognition? Like vocoder? Yeah. it's a vocoder yeah. on steroids, is what it is. So the original compression were vocoders way back when. And so that they but they don't they take in a vocoder and really just amp it way, way up. Did they I didn't think that teams ever used vocoders? Not in a regular sense, but I mean what Andy's talking about they were doing, then it's kind of like a vocoder from the 70s, except way way bigger you know well because big big dictionary big amounts of data plenty of bio maybe a little off topic ish but my understanding of, of teams is that it's it's always just been standard audio compression and, and data compression that it hasn't been anything that would resemble a vocoder because the bandwidth is high enough that it didn't really make sense to and doing the frequency analysis on it would actually i, I would assume it uses whatever cards are supported in the device. Yeah, and like just standard standard MP4. The, the, reason we use the, the reason we use vocode is if you're trying to go from words to speech recognition to also training the model to recognize the talk directly. So yeah, and it, it also um, Facebook, uh, they put out an image uh, segmentation code a couple days ago. Um, that you can then use to be like, okay, well, this this little blob looks like a face. Therefore, I want to transmit that with really high resolution. Uh, but this blob over here just looks like background fuzz. And so I'm going to translate that at a, a very lossy resolution. 
And you can do the same thing with voice where you can figure out what, what are the inflection points that I need yeah. to highly be precise on and what can I just have lossy well, encoding? It's, it's like smart VBR, smart variable bit rate, for yeah. data flow, whether it's image or voice or you know whatever. But that's, but that's quite different from the vocoder because the vocoder specifically is basically an FP analysis. And then you feed it. You're, no, you're you feed right. it. A, it's like after radio, right? You feed it, you feed it the same thing back and, and reconstruct the signal. From and the thing is that if it knows your voice, it can actually uh, error correct to make you look sound even better. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, Andy's finding out for us. Let's see here. Uh, so we're we're not sharing this to the, the folks out. I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay. One second. You can share now. Zoom in. There we go. Dustin picture. Thank you. Not Zoom. Are you still oh, recording the presentation? Or are we yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're still recording. Okay. So, but, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically, uh, Silk was the, or Satin was the original uh, uh, codec that was invented by Skype, I believe it was. And then, uh, uh, Silk uh, was the next gen version of it, and basically you can have bit rates anywhere from six to thirty-six k bit uh, that still sounds not terrible, and it's using uh, uh, complex Voodoo Magic uh, neural network stuff. Hmm. So that's, Silk was developed by Skype and Sat and Derivative, sorry. So that's yeah. both. So that's both very different from what I understood and different from a vocoder. So we're both yeah. wrong. All right. Yeah, so it's not, not using a vocoder. It's a neural network compression with a bunch of voodoo magic or hand waving. So yeah, I thought it was just like like MP3 and AAC with some, some special salt sprinkled on top. But well, if you add a vocoder into the mix, then you could you could go down onto the data itself to write a data representation and play around with this smart inflector or audio modifier on the fly that they're doing with low bit rate at the same time. You would just have to do one or the other, you do both. Yeah, when I just linked to the chat, um, Fabrice Ballard, who did QEMU and also FFmpeg, he has his own uh, Neural network based uh, binary uh, compression that he's working on. So that's still a progress. I don't think he's open sourced it, but uh, with the state of uh, Jahidra and Chat GPT, you can basically reverse engineer any source code right now. It's a binary that's not completely obfuscated. It would take a lot to hide real logic. No, I mean, well, Jahidra, I'm, thinking, Jahidra's I'm, binary. I'm thinking that you're correct. It would take some incredible scrambling code to, to mess with it. Uh, no, I mean, you can do really annoying loops. Yeah, that's true. There was a. Yeah, Hydra will give you some real authentic frontier gibberish sometimes. There was a reverse engineer on YouTube that had a t shirt that said, Everything is open source if you can read assembly. Yeah. And I mean, that's. You can write really bad assembly. Yeah. Which Deidre is a really interesting, fun rabbit hole to wander down that you can figure out why something is working the way that it is. Well, if you could integrate, so integrate that with D-Trace, that'd be really interesting. What'd you say? You would integrate what he was talking about the, uh, with D-Trace. Oh, D-Trace? Oh, when I was on the uh, Oxide computer chat, I think two weeks ago, uh, Brian Cantrell was one of the D-Trace authors who was on there, and I, I wrote some, some D-Trace in chat GPT-4 for him, and he was like, whoa. <laughs> but like that, that's, that's basically what I would have done. So how was the, what, what were you doing with D-Trace and, and chat? Did you um, uh, Brian Cantrell, who runs the, uh, he's the CEO of Oxide Computer. Uh -huh. They're making a rack that's about the size of a blue gene L. Oh. And, uh, yeah, they were just going over large language models that day for their their weekly chat. So they got a scaled system that they're doing. Yeah, it's about the size of a blue Gino rack, except it uses AMD processors. Oh, so Ryzen's with the cores. So say what? Ryzen's or the actual GPUs that the AMD is engineered in. Like data center quality processors. Okay, the, the 
the ultra, ultra multi floor horizons and stuff like that. Horizon's got multi, as a multi floor. Yeah, I mean, it'll evolve. I, I mean, it, it, it was just the processor that was most cost effective at the time that they built their first rack. Okay, so, oh, okay, so, oh. Let's, They're expecting let's, a lot of people to start balking at like AWS prices and start to go back on-prem. Well, also, <laughs> also the cybersecurity and compartmentalization too. Well, no, I mean, if you have a stable load and uh, have enough money to pay for an on-site data center, there are massive savings that you can have just because AWS is so gold darn expensive if you have enough work. So heavy compute. Yeah, or steady, stable compute. Well, we can amortize the cost to get, you know what you're going to, what you need to have and how much it's going to cost. Yeah, where AWS shines is say you have a Lambda and you want to call it 500 times in a minute. And then uh, for the next 24 hours, you don't ever call it. Yeah, bursty or momentary. Stuff. Yeah, any of you also when you don't want to worry about the hardware. Well, also, Amazon's network egress is really badly priced. You, yeah. you pay off the nose for network egress. Yes. That's the reason why things like CDNs exist. With the reduced egress costs. Well, that, that's why uh, Cloudflare has that whole thing where they they partnered with other data center stuff to have free egress. Free, free egress? Yep. So, like, say, if you're one of their partner uh, in one of their partner data centers, you can walk it through uh, Cloudflare to uh, serve up your data without any egress costs. <laughs> well, that'd be interesting. I would pull that off at the point when somebody's got to pay the tab eventually. Well, if you're using enough Cloudflare, uh, you get throttled and your stuff just stops working. So if you're big enough, you are paying for it. You're just paying them. Yeah. And they, they basically did a tier one uh, interconnect with those uh, data centers hmm. or whatever voodoo magic it took to get free traffic basically a lot of peering but i think we've hit the spot here where i'm going to hit stop on the, the recording just because we, we've wandered into the after hours here but i'm not chasing people away or anything like that